Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. Welcome back to another episode of Wild Wisconsin Off the Record. I'm your host, DNR's Digital Media Coordinator, Katie Grant. Here at the DNR, we use social media to help inform the public about the many facets of Wisconsin life that we touch on a daily basis. It's also a great source for us to hear your Wisconsin stories. One of those stories came from John Stelflew, a Sun Prairie resident, who tagged us in a Facebook post about heading out for the youth hunt with his nephew on his wedding anniversary. John and his wife Carolyn have, from the beginning of their marriage, had a few simple rules in place to ensure he'd be able to hunt and fish as often as possible. We sat down to learn a bit more about those rules and how John is able to balance his outdoor lifestyle with the rest of life in general. So sit back and listen in. My name's John Stelflew, born and raised in Wisconsin, um, lifelong outdoorsman, hunting, fishing, uh, everything Wisconsin. Um, you know, ultimate dream is to be able to uh, l- live uh, in, in by doing something in the outdoors. You know, unfortunately, I, not unfortunately, I, I mean, I have a job now, but it'd really be cool if uh, someday I could, um, you know, just make a living, you know, doing what I love. You know, in the meantime, I uh, I work hard, and uh, weekends and vacations are mainly spent uh, hunting and fishing. You know, uh, all all Wisconsin stuff. I I've, I've been fortunate. I do a bear tag a few years back. I got a bear, um, deer, turkey, uh, lots of fishing. Many many years it was almost exclusively musky fishing. Um, kind of graduated now into doing a little bit a uh, little bit of more multi species things. But I still mainly musky fish. But uh, you know, uh, many years I was a hunter education instructor. I haven't done that in a long time. But uh, I I I miss that. So that's a little bit about myself. And I'm Carolyn Stelflu, like John, lifelong Wisconsin resident. In fact, we grew up in the same town. Um, I am not the outdoors person, at least not his kind of outdoors person. <laughs> I mean, I like I love my gardening and walking and stuff like that, but I don't hunt. I hunted once. I do like to go fishing with him, but yeah, I'm a little different type of an outdoor person. Fantastic. So you guys recently celebrated a 30th wedding anniversary, correct? 31. 31? 31. 30, yeah, 31. 31. Yep, 88. 1988. All right. Yep. All right. We're wrecking the national average every day we get up. <laughs> there you go. How did you guys meet? <laughs> How does anybody meet in Wisconsin? Yeah. In a bar. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I was. Uh, one of us was making a pull. Going to shoot a make a pull shot. And that one was us, me. She was going to make a pull shot, and then she asked me what my advice was, and. <laughs> I really had no advice. She just thought I was cute. So (laughs) (laughs) the rest is history. Yeah, it worked. (laughs) Yeah. So when we talked, John, you said I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Carolyn as long as I could hunt and fish that entire time. So you said you're not quite as outdoorsy as John. (laughs) No. Have Have you come further than you were when you first met? Well, yeah, because I think that my not being the same type of outdoorsy is probably just a different generation. Like, I was around hunting. My brothers hunted. My dad hunted. My uncles. I mean, I knew that, you know, when hunting season was and it wasn't. My dad fished. My uncles fished. I was around all of that, but I was a girl. Mm -hmm. And... I, I don't know. I would, they just never took me along as much. Took my brothers, but, you know, not so much me. Then when John and I got married I, and we started going, well, we started going camping before we even got married. And then we bought the boat the year that Carissa was born or mm-hmm. a little bit before. And so, yeah, that's when I started, you know, doing any of that kind of stuff at all was after we got married. So you said musky fishing. Yep. What are your other absolute Wisconsin outdoors favorites? So, <clears throat> whitetail hunting, of course, but a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to draw a bear tag. And that, to me, was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done in the Wisconsin woods. Um, I did a DIY hunt. I spent that whole summer driving from, you know, we live down here near Madison, driving to Russ County. I mean, I get home from work Friday night, throw the 
throw the gear in the truck and and I from the fourth of July on I was gone every single weekend bait and bear. And I just stayed in a tent and, and camped. I left my boat right up there so I could fish. But we saw I saw a fair number of bear during my hunt. I was able to get, you know, your standard run of the middle of Wisconsin bear, not a giant, but you know, shot it with my bow, so I was excited. That was fun. That was something I really, really enjoyed. But you know, the problem is is everyone wants to do it and it's, you know, seven, six to seven, eight years to get a tag. But yeah, interesting story about the getting the tag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on. <laughs> Because I don't remember, he maybe had mentioned wanting to go bear hunting and stuff. I don't recall if he had or not. But I probably didn't. <laughs> it, well, if it was a seven-year thing, he could have and I could have forgot. But, um, and then I don't know where you were. I was you, at my mom's. Oh, okay. Or, yeah. Because yeah. I we were talking on the phone and I had grabbed the mail out of the mailbox and I was kind of flipping through it as I was talking to him. And I'm like what is this? <laughs> and I looked at or I looked at my phone and I'm like, did you apply for a bear tag? And he's like, why is everyone there? And I'm like, uh, yeah, it appears to be a bear tag here. So my, the- kill, my kill tag showed up in the mail and I figured I was a year out yet. You know, so I was a, I was a little early and, and I'm like, you got to send a picture of it. You know? So I made, her, I made her take a picture and send it to me and and I was so excited. So, and then, and then I said to her, I said, didn't I tell you about this? And yeah. she said, no, you never told me about right. this. So, didn't I tell you about this? Yeah, wink, wink. Yeah. <laughs> Which that's something that happens as a, as a man, a husband guy like me who, who's been married for 32 years. Because if you truly told your wife everything that goes on in the outdoor <laughs> world, <laughs> that marriage would have ended many years ago. <laughs> I've always said my biggest fear in life is that she said, well, if, if I die before her, she sells all my hunting and fishing gear for what I told her I paid for. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, that perfectly leads us to my next question. So early on, you guys set some ground rules to make sure that John could still get outdoors. So one, he had to hunt and fish where he said he was going to hunt and fish so that you would know where he was in case of an issue, that he would always come home at the agreed upon time, that he would always wear his safety harness when he was in a tree, that he would never spend ridiculous amounts of money on equipment without discussing it with you first. Clearly he's broken that rule. <laughs> <laughs> and that um, holidays, anniversaries, with one exception, the youth hunt, mm-hmm. uh, birthdays, families, all of that stuff comes before hunting and fishing. Were these orig- the original rules that you guys set or have you guys added to them or altered them kind of throughout the years? No, that's pretty much the original. And honestly... You got to remember too, thirty-one years. Um, there, it, there was no cell phones. I mean, that sounds so <laughs> bad to say, but there weren't. And so, I mean, that was very much. Those first rules were very much a safety issue. And we lived in our hometown. We, my um, sister and brother-in-law, own a farm. John hunted on a friend's farm. Well, a couple the, different farms. Several, yeah, I mean, several were, places early on. Yeah, there were several places to hunt, and I didn't want him ever leaving, not coming back. And then I'm like, okay, which of the six places do could I, he possibly could be? he possibly be? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it was very much a safety thing that was first and foremost on my mind. And I don't, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't think we've ever really revised anything too much. Um, it was those were just practical concerns. Well, we'd certainly appreciate the safety aspect of yeah. that. I lived up to my end of the deal, except once. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the the one time that I hear you broke these rules? I have a man room at home, and there's one piece of furniture in there that I absolutely despise. I hate it. I can't stand it. But I will never take it out of the man room because that furniture <laughs> is the end result of the one day that I didn't come home when I said I would. So I was with a good friend of mine and his cousin, and um, we were musky fishing up in northern Wisconsin. We had been fishing all, all weekend. We started, we fished Friday night, fished all day Saturday, and without asking what time we were going to be home on Sunday, I said to her, I said, well, I'm sure he's going to be wanting to head back to Madison by, you know, probably noon. This was when he lived in Rhinelander. And so I said, I'm sure I'll be back, you know, right around noon. And so we get fishing, and, and I mean, this guy's a machine. I mean, he, yeah. this, guy, he, this guy fishes, uh, I mean, I, we did one trip in a boat where we fished 18 hours, and I'm not exaggerating, 18 hours in a boat. 
Wow. Yep. And um, so this guy, I mean, back then we could fish and we could fish long hours. And he's like, I got nothing. We got on the water Sunday morning. He said, I've got nothing to get home for. He said, I'm going to fish till at least dark. And I'm going, and we all rode out to the landing together. And I'm going, this ain't going to be good. And, <laughs> and, and I finally talked him into coming off the water. We weren't having much luck that day, thank God. If the fish were going, I'd probably still be on the water. We caught one early in the day, and then it just kind of died. We couldn't get nothing going. So it was probably... 5.30 or 6 o'clock, I finally got off the water. Well, I think it might have been earlier than that even. I yeah. seem to recall only like 3 in the afternoon. Okay, so, but even, I knew I was in trouble. And <laughs> the funny thing is, is, is we're, we're driving back into town. And at that time, my personal vehicle had a St. Croix rod sticker on the back of it. And we're driving into town, and I see my wife and my two daughters pull out of the grocery store. And we, and they stop at a stoplight. And we slide in right behind them. And my buddy, who kept me out way past my curfew, said, hey, there's a St. Croix rod sticker on the back of that uh, Ford Explorer right there. And then my wife turns around and flips us a bird. And my buddy, says, my buddy says, that lady just flipped us a bird. I said, yes, that's my wife. I am really, really late. <laughs> From my perspective, I... <laughs> We were sitting at the lights, and I knew they were right behind us. And so I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and I see this timid <laughs> little hand waving really little cutesy. And I that and that's when I lost it, and that's when I flipped him off. <laughs> and then just continued to... I must have went somewhere. Yeah, you did. You didn't go right straight home. I think home. I knew how mad I was, and I figured I'd better go for a drive. So this green cabinet that I mentioned at the start of the, at, at the, start of the story had been sitting in a box in our sunroom for, I don't know, most of the summer. And so I walked inside, and I'm like, hey, she's not here. i got to get this cabinet put together, and maybe that will save the day. And I had it about half together when she got home. I did finish it, and... You know, as mad as she was, and I don't blame her for being mad, we, you know, as we tell the story now, we're laughing about it. But I learned my lesson then and there, and from that day on, I, I was always home when I said I'd be home, so. <laughs> and I did get the cabinet put together on yep. the deal, so. There and you go. and there we you still, go. me and my buddy, we, we still talk about that story to this day, so, yeah, it's a great story, so. <laughs> Those are some of the best ones. Yep, yeah. yep. Talk to me about taxidermy in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a fan. And, and this, I might, this might have been one of my rules even when we started, because I don't remember ever really agreeing to any sort of taxidermy. It's just not my thing. And that was before I knew what it costs to, for people to have taxidermy done. <laughs> Because so, I was I was reasonably stunned at and and this is with the John factor in there. I'm quite sure what I've been told a lot of those things cost <laughs> is not what they actually cost. I think I've been I think I've been pretty truthful about the taxidermy. When we lived in Rhinelander, my job brought me down here. And and so we commuted and I ultimately bought the house and, and I lived down here for a number of months before I brought the family down. And as I was commuting back and forth, I would bring carloads of stuff down. Well, one of the things I just, I mean, the easy stuff to bring was all my stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I was bringing, you know, my taxidermy down. All of a sudden, just all my taxidermy was, you know, going up. And I sent her a picture and I said, I think I just claimed the man room. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> that was one story. Then there was another story and this was one where I, I truly asked for forgiveness and, instead of permission. A <laughs> uh, number of years back, I shot an extremely rare turkey. It, it's called a smoke phase turkey. And, and what it is, is it's a turkey that doesn't have any black pigment in it. Um, so No, I'm sorry, it doesn't have any brown pigment in it. It doesn't have any brown. And, I mean, if you see wild turkey in woods, what color does it, I mean, it pretty much looks brown, right? Right. So this turkey is void of any brown. So it's white and blue and black. The, the, back, the back of the turkey is iridescent blue, and there's, the rest of the turkey is white and black. And when I shot it, I really didn't know what I had. I was by myself, and I shot it right away in the morning. And I come out of the woods, and, and I texted the group I was with. I said, oh, I shot a black and white Jake. 
Well, they thought, you know, black and white meaning, you know, run of the mill, you know, standard jig. But <laughs> it, tr that truly was a color. And so my buddy shot a bird <clears throat> and he come out and he said, well, where's that bird you shot? And I, and, I, and I told him and then he said, well, let me see it. And I held it up in a way, I held it by the feet and, and the wings kind of fell open and he took a picture of it and he said, he said, oh my God, John, he said, this thing's beautiful. Look at this picture. And so he showed me the picture and I said, I'm getting that mounted. And immediately we were making arrangements, calling taxidermists and, you know, to do a full body mount of it. And I never even asked her. I didn't even, that one, I just, I just, she said, what are you doing with that turkey? I don't want no stupid fan hanging in the house. I said, well, good, you're not going to get a stupid <laughs> fan hanging in the house. You're, you're, you're getting, getting the whole thing. In the house. And I know, if it, I know <laughs> that was a no. I mean, yep. I might have bent on deer head, but I <clears throat> yeah. know I never wanted a bird. That is... Oh my gosh, beautiful is not the term that comes to my mind. It is obnoxious. That, that was, I keep hoping the cat will eat it and the cat <laughs> isn't come through for me. <laughs> my one funny taxidermy story that I, uh, well, when we lived in Rhinelander, we rented, when we first moved up there, we rented a house. So we only had, um, we had two bedrooms, living room and dining room. It was just the first floor of a house. Mm -hmm. And we had our two daughters that shared a bedroom. And it wasn't a whole ton of room as they got older and bigger toys. And we'd given one of them a bouncy rocking horse type of deal and it could, wouldn't fit in their bedroom so it was out in the front room of the house mm -hmm. and I don't know why well I know the the mounts were all out there because that's where there was room for them but why they were right above that bouncy horse I'll never know and I think it was both of them on the horse really bouncing <laughs> and the next thing to know we knew the deer head is on the floor and it was one that had a nice drop tine which promptly snapped off the, uh, the, and I can't say that I felt real bad about it. But. <laughs> the good thing is it broke off clean, so it was yeah. very easily fixed. You can't even tell it. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So. And as an and as my other little way of dealing with the um, taxidermy in the house, I always hang Christmas bulbs off of the. There you go. Off of the horns. <laughs> so your daughters, did they ever get in on on the outdoor life with you at all? So they did. Um, neither one of them so much anymore. Um, Carissa is our oldest, and she got into hunting. Um, not, you know, not avid, but, but she'd go with me. Um, she didn't like getting up early. That was the one thing. And she didn't like the kick of the gun. You know, those were the two things. But she loved what I have now moved to. She loved that part of the hunt, which is the memories, the camaraderie, the friends, the people you go with. And as a young girl, for her for her to pick up on that and for her to enjoy that aspect of it as much as she did was always pretty special to me. Yeah. And uh, that was back before my dad passed. He was he was alive and then there was a landowner. We hunted on his farm and, you know, sadly they're both gone now, but she hunted for four years with me and <clears throat> prior to her fifth year of hunting our landowner, who was a family best friend, he died very suddenly, very unexpected. And I'll never forget the phone call. I was actually in my boat. I just uh, was back the boat in and I just got done musky fishing. And I remember I was in, I just got done with a guide trip and I was in retying and sharpening hooks. And my mother called and, you know, she said that, you know, he had passed. And I went inside and, and I was crying and, and they said, what's wrong? And I said, well, Nels died. And Immediately, Nels was a gentleman on the farm. Immediately, mm -hmm. Carissa said, I'm not hunting anymore. Aww. So I gave it a few weeks and, you know, maybe even a month. And, and I said, what's the deal? You know, as she said, no, Dad, I'm done. I'm done. And she's never hunted since, you know, so. Nels made things pretty <clears> special <throat> for her, though, too. The one, the one year he gave her, uh, uh, that was the, well, it was the first year she hunted. And he gave yeah. her this deer camp award. He typed it up and had a picture and she was she got a deer her first year so. yeah and she was allowed to bring beers to him and <laughs> all these little things that were her deer camp duties and yeah. i mean he made it real special yeah. for her so she hunted for a couple of years and then my youngest really got into fishing especially when she was younger and um oh she lives in town here still and but she's busy and we were going to fish all this summer and 
of course, I'm up early and they're not, and we could never, you know, get the schedule arranged. But when we were younger, one of her, one of her, and one of my favorite things, one of our favorite things, she'd call me in my office or on my cell phone, and uh, she'd say, "Dad, what are we having for supper?" And I said, well, "I don't know." And and she said, "Well, let's have nibblers." So what nibblers were? Um, that was bluegills. That's what she called them. And we lived very, very close to Boom Lake and Rhinelander, and there was one particular snag that I knew about kind of way on the backside, up in the backwater, and very few people ever went there. And you could go there you'd, in, 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 in probably a half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour at the most. Her and I could get enough bluegill for the family to eat. So I'd get home from work. I'd hook the boat up. We'd stop at a bait shop, buy a 36-count box of red worms, and throw the boat in the water and go fish for literally 45 minutes to an hour, come home, clean fish, and we never froze fish, ever. We just, yeah. we ate them all right away. The way that we heard about you guys was uh, from a Facebook post about yeah. taking your nephew out mm-hmm. for the youth hunt. Tell yep. me a little bit about how you got got into bringing him into the hunting world. Yeah, so going back to what Carolyn said earlier, my, my brother-in-law is a dairy farmer, and um, that's... Carolyn's sister is married to Mike, and, and they're dairy farmers, and they, they've got a very large dairy farm over to western Wisconsin. And Mike is his his two Mike and his and his two boys run it now. So and his two boys, our nephews, um, my one my one nephew Jason, he has kids. Well, the youth hunt is right at a time where they're harvesting. They're they're in the middle of chopping corn, and nobody has time to take them. And so he's got his his oldest son Johnny is now beyond the youth hunt, but I mentored him, and him and I shot several deer together. Um, and then Jason's next next boy is Gunner, and I mentored him this year. He shot a real nice nine pointer, and he's got two more boys coming up. But the problem is those guys can't ever get out because they're harvesting. So they call me, hey, can you take the guys youth hunting? And you know, so I did. And one of the first years I went, my brother in law Mike said isn't it your wedding anniversary? I said, well, it's not today, it's tomorrow. (laughs) And he said, well, right, but how did you pull that off? I said, well, because I need to take Johnny, that's my nephew, I need to take him hunting, you know. And uh, so she was gracious the first year, but then the second year she's like, they're not even your kids come on you know so we've kind of did an every other year thing you know you know ever since and 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 it's worked out well so so we've had fun with the youth hunt so it's just i just got to balance it between our between our anniversary and and the youth hunt and god bless her for you know letting me kind of go every other year so and that'll probably happen for a number more years yet because uh tristan oh yeah tristan and caleb caleb are coming up so they'll be i'll I'll have many more years of mentoring which i love doing it's it's absolutely i was as excited for gunner to shoot that real nice nine pointer that he shot this year as i would have been to to a shot a giant 10 pointer so it's pretty special right it's it's interesting that you are so accommodating to the anniversary aspect of it Mm -hmm. so my mom and and my mom and myself both have october birthdays and my dad goes out west duck hunting and pheasant hunting and whatever. And I have a memory of one birthday growing up where he was home because every single other one, it's the weekend of opening duck hunting out west. And he would be gone every year duck hunting. But it, it was the best time because then mom and I could just, we could go shop, we could do whatever. And dad wasn't there to say no. So it's, it's cool that you guys, you know, kind of around a similar time of year have well, have that worked out. Well, and we, that's kind of how we work things out because he when he the year it did get tough when he was guiding because that was a lot of time gone um and then he also fished a league musky fishing league when we lived in Rhinelander as well but we did something similar where it was Tuesday it was a Tuesday night league so the girls and I always knew that dad was going to be fishing that night so we, ha- I think it was The Bachelor. I literally think it was like when The Bachelor first, first came out. Yeah. So Carissa and I and Caitlin knew that that was the night that we'd watch The Bachelor and we'd make a frozen pizza and or something, you know. Sit- well, because John cooks as well. But yeah, maybe that's the trade-off. I You do all the cooking. Yeah. I let you fish <laughs> and hunt whenever you want, but you do all the cooking. But, you know, so the girls and I would do our own little thing, you know, and so 
even though he was gone, we had the trade off of the girls' night did something right. special for us. So, so I hate to throw you under the bus again. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> but a seven week old puppy oh. started deer season. Yeah, what this, were you thinking? This one was bad. <laughs> but it, it was, I <laughs> did bring that on myself. Yeah, th- so we've always been dog people. In fact, one of my first memories with her is we went and picked out our very first dog together, and it was a, a mutt from our hometown, or, and the dog's name was Duster, but it was the greatest dog ever. We, she was a great great dog of ours, you know, and and she lived a good life. And, and we had we had a chocolate lab, which I actually we actually adopted from one, from one of my guide clients, a guy that used to musky fish with me. And that chocolate lab, um, he was getting old, and... Um, he died, and I said, okay, I'm, pick, <clears throat> I'm picking a dog, and I want a yellow lab. So Willie died in June. Yeah, because yeah, Marty died Marty, in March. Yeah, Marty yep, Willie died. died in June, so we lost two dogs relatively quick. Um, but Willie died in June, and I said, well, and, and these two had already picked out a dog. They picked out a little one, which I never wanted that little dog, but he's now my best friend as well. <laughs> Larry, so. Larry's a 10-pound ch- chihuahua, yep. but with a 50-pound attitude. Yep. <laughs> So they had this little dog already in the house, so we had the little dog, you know, just for a little while. And I said, "Well, I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a lab." And and I looked all summer, I just didn't pull the trigger for whatever reason. And then it got into deer season, and I just kind of had forgotten about it. And well, she saw on Facebook that these people had yellow labs for 150 bucks. Well, it was in our hometown. It was in our hometown, right where I deer hunt, because I don't deer hunt near here. I deer hunt over in Western Wisconsin, Western Wisconsin, Trumple County. And I said, "Well, I'm gonna stop on my way home." To look at these dogs and so I had a bunch of cash on me and and I pulled in and I think she had three three males left and in this one dog he just would not get out from underneath my feet and it wasn't the one I had my eye on you know I was looking at these two other ones because this dog was a runt and I you know and I wasn't interested in him but he just wouldn't get out from underneath my feet and so I brought I brought him home and and uh the fact that he was a runt is beyond me because oh. he's now 98 pounds <laughs> But the worst part about it was I had identified two really large bucks that year, and I was into it that year. And I brought this dog home on November 7th, and I had a bunch of vacation planned. And so it wasn't like I was just gone on the weekends. I mean, I think I was gone, if you take November 7th to whatever last weekend of gun deer season, I bet I was away from home probably a dozen of those those days. So... I got a seven-week-old lab, and in in, in, in the the first twenty days of that dog being home, I'm gone for a dozen <laughs> of them. So I got home from from gun deer season that you know Sunday, the last weekend of gun deer season, and I I don't know if this is true, but this is what I remember. <laughs> They met me at the door and they threw the dog at me and said, take care of this dog, we're out of here. I mean, that's that's kind of what I remember. I don't think that actually happened, but I mean, that's the vibe I got when I talk, walked through the door. So there was no late season hunting for me that year. There was, it, was, it was me and Stormy after that. So so that was that was not a very nice thing to do. But. And it wasn't, it's not that Stormy is a bad dog. It's a seven-week-old puppy. That's yeah. a right. lot of work. It's a lot yeah. of work. You're yeah. outside every half hour. Hour, and even doing that, he's peeing somewhere at some point, and oh. or finding the shoe to chew on. Yes. Or yeah, he's eat, he's eaten a lot of shoes, and always my shoes. Yeah. Always. Do you guys have any final advice for people who are trying to figure out? Okay, how do I balance this whole family life thing with their love and passion for the outdoors? Oh, it's just there's one word. It's it's compromise. I mean, and respect. Comprom- two words: compromise and respect. Yeah, you know. Um, I remember one year, the girls were swimming, and when they were in high school, I didn't get much deer hunting time because they were swimming. And I remember getting up that morning. And it was let's just say November third. I mean, it's right in the middle of mm-hmm. of, of the rut, and and I'm just thinking, oh my God, today's going to be great. This front blew through, the temp drop, we're gonna have frost, we're gonna have light west winds. I mean, this is gonna be this is gonna be great hunting and I and we had we had to go to Stevens Point for a swim meet. And and I remember sitting there and I know Steve shot a big one that day, Brian shot a big one that day, and I think Jordan shot a big one that day. And I'm at a pool 
in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, not hunting. But I wouldn't have been any other place. That's where I needed to be. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that I think guys who are that are as passionate as I am, and I really have witnessed it in muskie fish, fishing, I've seen guys lose their family, lose their spouses, lose almost everything over a silly green fish. And you just, as the person who's in the outdoors, you have to keep it in perspective. And you have to keep it in perspective all the time. Because even in, because it's the rut, because it's opening day, if there's other things going on at home and and the plumbing's broke or, you know, just whatever, sometimes you got to step back as a hunter and fisherman and go, I'm not going to go today. You know, I I need to be here. But, and, you know... For what she did for me, she just never, ever said, you're not going. I don't want you to go. Yeah, compromise and respect. I think that's that's what it is. Well, and have the conversation. Mm-hmm. We, we talked about it. Um, mm-hmm. And granted, we were both kind of on the same page from the beginning because, like I said, we grew up in the same town and hunting was what it was. Everybody was used to it. I never expected that whoever I married wouldn't hunt. Um mm-hmm. So so that helped. But that said, we did talk about it because bow hunting is different. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, That's a big time commitment. Yeah. Try it. If you are the non-hunter, the non-fisherman too, you give it a try. Maybe you'll like it. I did try to go hunting one time. And weirdly enough, for whatever reason, it was the year I had our fir- Carissa, our first daughter. Why I chose to go hunting when I <laughs> then because she was born October twenty fourth. Oh, excuse me, August twenty fourth. So it would have been the next season. Why I would choose to go hunting it when I have a baby at home? It was such a blizzard that yeah, year. Blizzard. It was stupid because I am I no matter what hunting or fishing or anything. I'm a fair weather right. hunting or fishing or anything. And but I went and um, I was the firearm thing didn't bother me and we'd practiced and stuff like that. That I was all I was used to that, but. He literally just set me where he thought would be a good spot. and But even getting that far was bad enough because I'm short and it was a lot of snow. And so we got as far as we could get and still be in the woods. <laughs> and he put me against this tree and was like, shoot anything that comes along. <laughs> Which you got to. When you're first going out, you can't be picky. And so... I am watching and watching, and all of a sudden I can hear something, so I start paying attention, and sure enough, here comes this doe, um, and I'm thinking, oh, no, and then here comes her fawns. So I'm like, oh, no, I, now I really can't shoot it, and I, but I know he's coming behind them, so I am literally standing against that tree just going, shoot, shoot, <laughs> just trying to make it go away. We have we enjoy going fishing together. Yeah, so, you, so that you, had yeah. yeah, that's you started that here later in life, and we, yeah. we had a ball this summer. Caught a lot of pilot fish this summer. It was yeah. yeah, yeah, and in fact, I actually held my first fish of my own. I haven't bait my own hook yet, but I did hold that fish by <laughs> myself. Yeah, <laughs> so, so. never say never. Yeah, re- real never nice smallmouth that she caught. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's the other thing is, is try and go together. And he never pushed it. I didn't like it. I didn't go again. It was no big deal. It wasn't, you know, but I gave it a try. To hear more of John and Carolyn's stories, follow Stage 4 Outdoors on social media. We'll be back in two weeks with another great episode featuring more inside voices on Wisconsin's outdoors. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. And while you're at it, leave us a review. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.